Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Scott Silverman, co-founder of Commerce Next. We are a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and DC, DTC brands. And on behalf of my two co-founders, Veronica Sonsev and Alan Dick, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, The Secret to Great E-Commerce Experience Collaboration. Uh, this was a really fun webinar for me to put together because uh, it's focused on um, two of my favorite topics, which are culture and organizational structure. And we have a great presentation and then a panel discussion uh, to follow that uh, to cover these topics. And as always, we encourage your participation uh, in the chat room, asking questions. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. And uh, thank you all for tuning in and uh, making time to listen or listen to the replay. Uh, so, uh, full disclosure for, uh, for me is uh, that uh, I didn't have a great day at uh, Wordle today. I got a four out of six. So, um, just want to be honest with everyone so you know uh, everything is, is real and authentic in this webinar. Um, but I wanted to start, start with a few important thank yous. Uh, we have a, a great uh, panel of speakers, Jeff Gerstel, CMO of B&H uh, Photo, Vivian Chang, VP Growth, uh, Clorox uh, DTC, Tyler Wozni, uh, SVP Digital at Madison Reed, and Asim uh, Zahir, CMO of Glassbox. So all representing some different business models, and I think it'll make for a great um, panel discussion when we get to that. And we recognize how busy you all are. And uh, again, I want to thank you for taking your time uh, to share your insights with our community. So um, all of the speakers will be getting a nice uh, thank you gift from GiftNow. Um, and also we will be randomly selecting five uh, attendees from the webinar um, and to give them uh, a nice prize from GiftNow as well, who is our gifting partner. And I wanna give a big thank you to Glassbox for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, we couldn't bring these to you uh, on a regular basis like we do. Um, without uh, the support of our sponsors. And it's really been a pleasure working with the Glassbox team on the webinar. I, uh, I appreciate them supporting this topic and uh, one that I think is really important to the community. So a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, first, we recently announced that registration's open for our annual summit. It's June 21st and 22nd in New York at the Hilton Midtown. Uh, we'll be covering uh, topics such as setting up shop in the metaverse, uh, scaling on uh, with TikTok influencers, winning the war for talent, um, a whole uh, you know slew of other topics. And uh, we, we're expecting around 1,200 people. Again, it's uh, June 21st and 22nd. Uh, you can go to commercenext.com to learn more and apply to attend. And uh, if you are heading out to Las Vegas to go to Shop Talk, um, we are hosting a reception there, and uh, this is for the uh, brands and the retailers in our community. Uh, we're doing it at a fun venue called Top Golf. Um, you'll have a chance to practice your golf swing, um, play bar games, or relax with a nice cocktail. Uh, and if you're interested in joining, you can email uh, my co founder, Alan, at commercenext.com for more information about that. And our next webinar is in two weeks on February 23rd. It's called Capitalizing on the Gifting Economy, How Do You Stack Up? Featuring Barbara Ann Hagen at Thrift Books, Mike Lackman, the CEO of Trade Coffee, Lauren Friedman from the Etailing Group, and John Gresh at Gift Now. And it's going to be moderated by my fellow co-founder, Alan Dick. A uh, couple more things. Uh, we are continuing with season two of our podcast. Uh, this one uh, is... The one that just dropped is with Justin Yoshimura. He's the CEO of CSC Generation. Uh, they own a number of different retail brands, Sir Latab, One King's Lane, Z Gallery, a few others. Uh, he talks about culture, playing the long game in retail, and he tells a, fun, a number of fun stories, but one about when I was running e-commerce conferences a number of years ago, and he brought a fake ID uh, to get access to the event because he was under 21. You can find all the information on commercenext.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Um, and if you missed any of our events, uh, you can always go to our YouTube channel. Um, we have, you know, at this point, hundreds of videos 
from uh, conversations with Commerce Next, from webinars, past sessions. Uh, so make sure you go and check that out. There's a lot of great content on there. Probably we'll cover just about you know, any topic that you are dealing with at the moment. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, don't worry about missing anything. We're recording uh, the webinar and we'll make it available uh, tomorrow. And I just wanna show you where a few things are on your screens to, to make this uh, as useful uh, of your time as possible. So uh, there's the main panel for all the interactivity. It's on the upper right, uh, chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. Uh, chats where you can give our speaker high fives, you can comment on something they said, and you can interact with other audience members there. And then if you have a question, uh, you'll see the Q&A uh, right to the, to the right of the chat. Um, that is where you can ask questions for uh, our speakers, and we'll try to cover as many of those as we can during the webinar. Uh, you can enter your uh, question down on the bottom, and uh, if you see a question that someone else submitted and you like it, you can upvote it, and that helps us prioritize the questions that we're going to take on the webinar. Uh, there are a number of handouts. Uh, so uh, Asim Zahir uh, is his presentation, his slides are uh, one of those that you can download those. And thank you to Glassbox uh, for sharing a couple others. One is Forrester's 22 predictions for customer experience and a white paper understanding why, the why behind consumer digital shopping behaviors. So make sure to uh, grab those handouts and download those. Um, and uh, just a couple other things. Uh, if you're listening to the replay, um, you'll see on the bottom right there is where you can get the downloads as well as uh, the results of the polling questions. Uh, we'll be doing a few of those in just a little bit. Um, as far as today, uh, what we're going to be doing is we have a presentation uh, on the secret to great customer experience collaboration from Asim Zahir at CMO Glassbox. We're going to do some audience poll questions here, how you're thinking about this topic, and then we have a panel discussion with BNH Photo, Madison Reed, and Clorox. Uh, so I, at this point, would like to uh, welcome Azim Zahir. He's the CMO of Glassbox. So Azim, uh, thank you for joining us and looking forward to hearing your thoughts on uh, e-commerce collaboration. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I guess in the spirit of full transparency, I'll admit I've, I'm maybe one of the three people in the world who's never played Wordle. Uh, so I hope to get on that uh, fairly soon. Um, thanks again. Uh, the topic here, as Scott mentioned, is what, what leads to a great uh, e-commerce experience? And it really oftentimes uh, comes down to collaboration. And I hope to share some insights with you in the next few minutes. Our company, Glassbox, in case you're wondering, we work with uh, large brands across various industries to help them improve their digital experience, be it uh, through web or uh, mobile, et cetera. And so let me dive right in. First of all, you know, let's, let's take a look at uh, what's, what's going on out there. Most companies, including yours, more than likely, has prioritized digital experiences, particularly in light of what's been happening in the world in the last couple of years, above all others. And clearly it is a priority, as you can see here uh, with some of the stats and the data on the slide. And it's been quantified by various third parties like Forrester, et cetera, uh, and showcases here the fact that if you have a positive or an industry leading digital experience, it translates directly into uh, dollar value and bottom line for you. And frequently customers, uh, as has been seen through a lot of the research are willing to spend more money with you if they have a positive experience. Of course, the negative aspects um, or the negative uh, negative experience can lead to you know much more significant negative impact for you because switching costs are so low when you move around the digital world. And so it's a priority for businesses. However, how's everybody doing? Um, you know, most will admit that they are struggling with meeting the needs of their customers and prospective buyers uh, that visit them through the, their digital platforms. And very few, you know, around 10% think they really understand, you know, their prospective buyers uh, behaviors very well. And so everybody feels 
you know, they're falling short. Everybody mostly feels that they can do better. And, and most feel they don't really understand what's going on. And so why is it so hard? You know, let's take a look at that. And what we have found with many of the companies that we work with and, and talking a lot to a lot of folks who research this space uh, frequently is that there are silos that exist. And this should be, you know, no surprise. We've heard this for decades as it relates to other aspects of business and, and, and be having a bit an efficient business, you know, structure and objectives are different across different um, organizations. Systems are different. The data that's being collected is not aggregated and shared and analyzed and correlated very frequently. And so you have things happening at, you know, in one side of the business that may not be visible to another. However, if that information was accessible and you were able to correlate the two, you might have greater insights and be able to serve your customers better. And so these silos exist and they're inhibiting progress, especially in the digital world. Um, if you look at you know, polling of, of organizations in the last number of years, each time, number one issue that uh, most people uh, identify is the fact that cooperation across the organization is lacking. Uh, it could be better. If it were better, they could improve the experiences that customers have with their brand. And so, you know, I don't want to belabor that point any further. People recognize there's a challenge here, there's a problem, and we need to do better. And so, you know, how do we improve this digital experience? And so let me give you a, a, a brief overview of what Glassbox does. And I want to then segue quickly to a couple of examples of, of a couple of different companies that we've worked with and the problems that we've solved. Um, fundamentally, we are a software platform uh, that helps you improve the experience that a, a prospect might have when they visit you through your digital platform, be it your website, be it your mobile application. And so what we do is we capture that visit. We, we monitor and, and we take a look at um, how they interacted with you, um, how they navigated to uh, you know, your product or services and whether they transacted or not and whether they abandoned you at a certain point in time. We analyze that. We look at all the clicks and what, if any errors might have popped up and so forth. Um, we help visualize what's been going on for you across those millions of sessions that might be taking place on your platform during a particular month uh, and make it easy to decipher and understand and gain insights. And then we help you prioritize what you need to improve upon or change and then quantify that actually that might lead to greater revenue or customer satisfaction uh, or an improved NPS score or whatever matters to you. And so uh, at a very high level, this is essentially what we do and what we offer. Um, what we also do is we are able to provide a singular platform that can collect and aggregate information that is used and leverageable across the organization. And again, I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Um, and so that the user UX team, you know, can take a look at this and know if they need to make any changes to the user uh, interface um, by the uh, product or the IT team to see if, you know, the underpinning platform or technology um, is uh, inadequate or not performing or slow in any particular way. Um, you can also understand why conversions aren't happening when people are visiting your site, why shopping cart abandonment is taking place and so on and so forth, or why there's a spike, you know, in customer service tickets or calls. Um, again, where this is a way in which through technology to um, get everybody under the same umbrella and be able to collaborate and work together to solve problems and improve experiences. So here's a couple uh, of examples uh, that uh, we have and a couple of uh, companies that we've worked with. And I can't name who they are, uh, unfortunately, because uh, these are challenges that they experienced that they uh, solved uh, through our uh, technology. And so uh, one here is uh, a very large uh, wholesale retailer, uh, wholesale club, you know, a, a name that many of you, uh, at least in the U.S., are probably quite familiar with. And they were running into a problem when folks were um, trying to log in to their mobile application and to either 
uh, shop and, and purchase uh, or merely just browse. And so this was a, a, an issue that had cropped up. And um, the way in which they were able to zero in on why that was taking place was first uh, the customer support or customer success organization flagged the fact that there is a spike all of a sudden in customer support requests. And so as a result, the team sprung into action and I apologize, a lot of information on the slides. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this um, from left to right. Let me just fill this out. Um, essentially, if you take a look at all the way on the left, this was their login screen. And so what folks, th those individuals who were trying to log in and, and shop who had uh, a problem with their password or they forgot their password or it wasn't matching, um, got a, a, a pop-up window basically a dialogue box that says they don't match. Well, unfortunately at the time, there was uh, no way in which uh, that user could notify <laughs> the company or the, or the retailer that this is a problem and they'd like to reset their password. Um, and so I'll explain how kind of we determined all of this. Uh, because all of this was being captured, um, the uh, analytics team, was able to segment all of these user sessions uh, and find out and look at all of the ones that were leading to support calls. And what they found was they were the ones where people were having trouble logging in and then calling customer support because they did not have a way in which to notify the company that they want to reset or do something. And so we revealed that by analyzing these sessions that the dialog box was actually covering the forgot email um, link, which as you see here all on the right, which should be visible. And so they were able to segment it, um, uh, narrow down into where the issue was taking place, notify the UX team. So first the customer support team flagged the issue, analytics team analyzed what was happening, notify the UX team to make the change, roll out the change to their product and therefore the support tickets declined by over 90% as a result. Very simple example, but these types of things have significant impact to your user experience and can lead your customers or your prospects to your competition. So that's one example. Um, another one that I wanna share with you uh, is another retailer. Um, I won't uh, again name who it is, but uh, this uh, sometimes happens where they want to roll out uh, a campaign a promotion uh, for a new product, in this case, uh, new cozy jeans, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go right to the, uh, to the, to the reveal or the punchline. Well, new cozy jeans was not a link, and one would think, you know, if you go to this page, that you could click on that and, and browse and or buy a pair. Um, but it's sometimes very difficult and takes quite a while to determine that that's a problem, that that's actually taking place. And so I'll walk you through how, you know, they went about figuring this out. So issued a promotion for a new line of products. So what's happening is, you know, they're capturing all of the events, you know, when somebody uh, starts a session on their, on their uh, web uh, uh, website. And so we're taking a look, they're browsing, looking at products, adding to cart, um, checking out, you know, taking a look, contacting customer service, uh, interacting with a chat bot or what have you. Um, but what they found is once they analyzed these journeys, if you will, these are all individual journeys that a, a consumer has on your site, where are people struggling? And so by looking at that journey, this retailer was able to determine the exact point in time during that journey where they were struggling, where they were either maybe potentially rage clicking, they were leaving your site, they were trying to navigate uh, to that page through some other means. You were able to determine these things by analyzing all of these journeys and these sessions. And so you can find the cause of frustration in that way. And this is what they were able to do. And so then you can modify the page however you wish, either make that, that page that I showed you previously hot link directly to the cozy jeans or have them get there some other way. But once you find that and you determine the reason for abandonment or struggle, you can make that change. You can increase your conversion rate. Again, a simple example, but very meaningful to the bottom line of this company. Only way to do that 
is to be able to analyze and react and notify the appropriate team to make the necessary change, which will then affect your overall business. And so with that, you know, I'll, I'll summarize here. Um, take a look at your, your tech stack, right? Can you find these anomalies? Do you have that ability, right? Do you have, are you understanding the interactions and the journeys that your users or your prospective customers are taking on your digital platforms, whatever those might be? Um, and can you determine where in issues are arising and struggles are taking place? Um, you need to be, if, and, and hopefully you're able to do that. And then you can prioritize what's important, where changes need to take place and where the greatest impact your business will be. And highly recommend have a single source of truth that has data that can be shared across organizations so that you can understand what needs to happen and when and how it affects, uh, you know, the overall business. And so this is, um, you know, what our recommendation is to you all based on our experience working with hundreds and hundreds of, of companies uh, in many, many industries. And it sounds simple, but it, it can be challenging unless you have the right processes and also the right technology in place. And so with that, um, that's all I had to share. I'll turn it back to you, Scott, and then uh, we could have a conversation with the rest of our panel. Great. Thank you, Asim, uh, for that overview and uh, those great examples. I could, you know, just sense all of the UX and CX people listening who are sympathizing with those kinds of situations. And uh, I think, as we'll be talking about in the panel discussion, some of them are self-inflicted, some of them are just pure accidental. Um, and uh, well, I'll, I'll, we'll bring you back up. There was a, one question that came in for you, uh, Asim, but we'll do that after the polling questions. So um, yeah, we, we wanted to hear from everybody uh, that's listening in uh, a little bit about uh, their thoughts on some of these topics and what's happening in their organization. So you'll see, uh, in, again, in the upper right of the webinar interface, uh, there's polls and you can see which ones are closed or open and you can monitor how uh, we're collecting all the survey information. So why don't we start, go to the first poll. Um, so this uh, question is, how would you describe the access to information at your company to ensure that everybody understands what a good or bad e-commerce experience is. So what, this is describing the access to the information that is shared. Um, is it fully shared? Some information is shared, but there's room for improvement. Uh, you're just getting started sharing or you unfortunately, uh, your information is stuck in silos. So let's see what folks are saying. Well, sadly, around a fifth of you uh, are saying that information is stuck in silos. That was a little higher than I expected. Um, and the, we have around uh, 40, 45% are saying that some information shared, but there's room for improvement. So hopefully um, through this conversation, we'll identify some best practices for how that can be done. So let's close this one. Um, the next question, uh, is how would you rate your company's ability to fix situations where the goal of a department or a process is in conflict with delivering the best e-commerce experience? Um, so this would be a situation where somebody thinks uh, it's you know their job to do X, but unfortunately X ends up uh, detracting from that customer experience. So um, you, A, are best in class and everyone's working towards the same customer experience goals. Uh, B, you mostly fix conflicts, but occasionally a process that erodes customer experience still persists. Um, or C, numerous processes that are known to erode customer experiences continue, and there's really not a plan to fix those. Um, so kind of as expected, where uh, everybody is kind of in the middle uh, or the majority around 65%. Um, you know, you mostly fix the conflicts, but occasionally there are some persistent processes that are not good for customer experience. So um, I, I think we're going to uncover a lot of good ideas during the panel discussion uh, to focus on those. So um, last question, uh, and this is a tee up for our next webinar in two weeks, capitalizing on the gifting economy. 
Uh, and um, let's ask that question. So uh, which are the following merchandising tactics do you use to showcase gifting opportunities on your site? You can check all that apply. Uh, the options are a gift center, uh, you know, which is the destination on your site specifically, showcasing gift ideas, gifts by attribute, allowing customers to sort gift items by price, recipient, occasion, so on. Top sellers, highlighting popular gift items. Uh, D, what's new uh, for newly added products that are suitable for gifting. Or uh, E, other. And you could um, write those in the chat in the webinar if you have something that's different than those four choices. All right, so we have about a quarter are doing top sellers uh, and what's new. Uh, we have maybe another 20% um, using a gift center. Uh, so, and then not a lot doing gifts by attribute. Um, and I haven't looked at the others yet. Let me see if there's any in the chat. Don't see any yet. So, uh, but anyway, they're not one of those four. All right. So, um, thank you all for uh, for sharing a little bit. Um, I, you know, it, it's pretty clear. Um, very few of the people on the call are uh, perfect in this area. So, I'm glad we're going to have this conversation, and and hopefully you'll find that helpful for everyone. So, why don't we um, go ahead now and bring up our panel and get started with the panel discussion. All right. Uh, thanks for coming back, Asim. Uh, welcome, Tyler, Vivian, and Jeff. Um, so, Asim, I'm just going to start off real quick. So, there was a question from Carlos um, from your presentation. They wanted to know how you're <clears throat> distinguishing between engineering and the dev slash ops team. Do you can, do you yeah. have an answer to that? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, oftentimes uh, DevOps and, and IT uh, are synonymous and get lumped in together. I, what we're alluding to there is the team that's charged with operating and maintaining typically uh, your digital platform, you know, whatever that might be. Engineering are the ones, are the developers, the coders, you know, that built whatever your, your presence might be. And so oftentimes a separate group, sometimes they're the same group, uh, but it was just trying to delineate developers versus operators, if you will. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna have, I want each of the, uh, the rest of the panel to introduce themselves, um, their company and their role, um, you know, in your company, you know, describe your business model a little bit, because I think we have some pretty diverse business models represented on our panel. Um, and then please also share how customer experience is managed at your company in terms of who takes the lead and who else is involved. So Tyler, we'll start with you. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Wozny. I am the SVP of digital at Madison Reed. Um, if you don't know Madison Reed, we are a direct consumer hair color brand um, selling both uh, at home hair color um, as well as having um, just now 52 hair color bars across the country where we sell retail and, and services. Um, and so at Madison Reed, um, Customer experience is really everyone's job. Um, I think that's something that we really hire for and that we really think about when, when we're looking at folks. So when I go down the list of department, everything from creative, um, my team and digital, um, our color crew, which is our customer service department, like everyone's really thinking about that customer experience uh, because we've proven that good customer experience leads to retention. Um, and so that really simple business metric uh, gives us the opportunity to think about it all the time. Um, knowing that like driving customer satisfaction is in fact um, driving business metrics. And, and Tyler, is there anyone that would say they quote own um, customer experience or you, that's not the way you approach it? Uh, funny enough, we, we recently um, uh, promoted someone into the role of VP customer experience. And their, their main metric, if you were to give them one, would be like our CSAT score, our customer satisfaction score. Um, and we're trying this out as a trial uh, to see if it works, but the idea there is bringing all those leaders together in a holistic way to, 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 to think broadly and, and deeply about the different CX kind of opportunities we have. Um, it's, it's very new, like a couple of weeks old. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it works. Great. 
Uh, Vivian, uh, if you could introduce yourself as well, please. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, I head up the director consumer practice within Clorox. And so um, we sit at an interesting place. And of course, legacy CPG company um, traditionally has sold through retailer relationships. Um, and now you know, these brands are in a world where consumers want to buy direct from the brand want to buy from Amazon, retailer.coms or physically in the brick and mortar presence. And so uh, we are one part of that holistic experience. And so when it you know, speaks to customer experience, interestingly, we actually talk about the end consumer, you and I as consumers, and then customers are the Target, the Walmarts, the Costco's, you know, even the Amazons of the world. Uh, so there's a, there's two tiers in, um, in the sphere that we play in. And so, you know, consumer experience, I'd say is kind of split. So there's the, you know, the care team. So more like uh, customer service agents and so forth. But then there's user experience leads and then, you know, marketing, brand marketing, or even like brand steward kind of positions. And I'd say it's a little bit of everyone's job to think about that consumer experience and, you know, how does it all link together? I think the, the challenge of it that you know, we know that we face is consumers might get very different experiences depending on where they are doing their transaction. Uh, but where can we at least create a link from the website or the email touch points to the physical product packaging um, and make it as seamless or as convenient as we can? And I mean, I guess similar follow up uh, question for you that I gave to Tyler is, is there someone that um, that is their chief responsibility to uh, manage customer experience or is it distributed or how, do, how does that work? Yeah, we don't have a person who owns that. Um, it's really a part of everyone's job. Um, I think the guiding principle, same as what Tyler said, is that we know that the consumer experience drives revenue, you know, drives repeat purchase, um, you know, helps the acquisition and word of mouth and all of those things. And so, you know, we don't really have a lead across it, um, but it's a little bit kind of embedded in that you know, in the revenue or the everyday business KPIs. Great. And uh, Jeff, last but not least, um, tell us, I, you know, introduce yourself, B&H, um, and, uh, you know, and how you're managing customer experience and who, who takes the lead and who else is involved. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jeff Christel. I'm the CMO here at B&H Photo. We're a retailer of um, uh, photo, video, audio, and all kinds of creative and consumer electronics technology, whether through uh, B2B, B2C, um, both online. We have one store here in New York, and we even take orders by phone, which might be an anomaly these days. But when we talk about experience, it's it's really um, that that one-on-one -on -one personal experience is something that we we constantly try to create and grow. In terms of the lead, I, I'm going to echo what what Tyler and Vivian said. It's really uh, a company-wide effort from our CEO down to everyone in the company that everyone owns the customer experience. I would say if there's a facilitator of that, it's me. Um, several of the quote-unquote customer-facing departments, the care center, uh, our phone department um, would report to me, but there's others as well that would be more responsible on the, on the uh, you know, some of the digital areas that, that like Asim was referring to. So I'm going to kind of stick with you uh, for the next question, Jeff. And, um, you know, was there always as much coordination across departments for customer experience as there is now? And if not, can you describe, you know, what changed and, and the impact that you've seen from that change? Yeah, um, I would say the answer is kind of yes and no. Yes, it's always been sort of number one in our culture. So it's, it's been there. It's, it's kind of, you know, it goes up and down a little in how well we, we've delivered on that, but it's always been key. And I'd say um, the no part would be the, Asim had that slide on silos, and I was kind of cringing when he showed that. So I think like many companies, the cooperation is an area that, that we identified as something where we could do a lot better. Um, about two years ago, our CEO kind of decided 
he's had enough of this and and we need to get better and really live up to what we're saying we're going to do and he put a and consolidated a bunch of this sort of um uh experience type elements of the business under me so the result of that i guess it's had some benefits but one of them is i might need tyler's product because it's caused a lot of gray hair so um it's it's interesting i i think the key is what i've seen is is really that executive focus from the ceo down on saying um you know this is going to be our top priority we're going to um make this happen no matter what because because i think it's got to be like a, a a really um embodied company effort to to really truly show results i did a little research i looked at the top um five retail bankruptcies of 2020 and i saw in each of them one was we deliver exceptional service to each customer you know two the customers at the center of all we do three the customers first and you know i guess it maybe it wasn't quite true so i think there's a there's a lot of words and a lot of bullshit flying around and the real challenge is how do, how do you make this real and not just a lot of words yeah i mean that i i think uh well i don't know tyler do you, do you have anything you wanted to add there and, and i'd be interested in what made um madison Reed decide to um you know bring in that that vp of customer experience um you know was was that because you felt like there was uh, more coordination that needed to happen. Yeah, Madison Reed is really interesting. Uh, and, I, and I love what you said just now, Jeff, you know, fewer words, more action um, or more experience maybe. So with Madison Reed's story, because we started as direct consumer only, you know, our core culture was really around digital customer experience. As we opened up our first and now 52nd hair color bar, we now have this large team thinking about like the physical world. And so um, those two teams had very different languages for how to think about customer experience. Um, and now as we go into our next phase, you know, looking at expanding in, in, in retail partners, Ulta being the first one, Target uh, second one, um, you know, that's a whole other world of customer experience that we want to um, have more input in. So I think it's those three kind of legs of the stool that needed to all talk to each other that hadn't, um, that, that there's no natural kind of um, pathway or ability to do that. And so that that key role um, is meant to, to, to kind of bring those three, those three parts together and, and create a common language so that whenever you walk into a hair color bar, you get that same feeling and brand essence that you do when you land on the homepage, homepage of the site or visit an end cap in Ulta. Um, so we're, we're getting some good questions in here, but I, I guess, Asim, I wanted to ask, I mean, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, how everybody's organized for customer experience. So is there any other models that, um, that you see, uh, you know, in your daily work that, uh, that hasn't been mentioned so far that our audience should take into consideration? Well, I mean, um, it's funny. <laughs> We've seen a lot of different models, uh, and it's true of even the companies I've worked for. Uh, I had a boss who, many years, said to me, it, it's, "It's very uh, poignant." He said, uh, "Multiple leaders equals no leader," <laughs> and so somebody needs to take the lead on ensuring um, good customer, or in my what would I care about digital customer experiences. And so, um, it, and it depends on what metric that they are responsible for. Is it revenue? Is it NPS? You know, what is it? And so, depending on what that metric might be, someone needs to take the lead on that. And, and that's been most effective. At least they can rally uh, people in support and, 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 and make that outreach to the other groups that influence that metric um, and respond if it's not, you know, where you need it to be. And so... I would say, you know, there doesn't need to be some sort of like anointed Lord God King, but certainly somebody who's the lead uh, around whatever metrics that matter to your business. Um, I think that's important um, because then people know how to react and respond if, if change needs to take place. So, so there are a couple of questions that came in from the audience around metrics. And one person 
you know, just asked about the top, you know, top CX um, KPIs. Um, someone else asked specifically about net promoter score, um, which you just mentioned, Asim. But um, maybe Vivian, start with you. Um, you know, what are some of the KPIs that you use for customer experience and um, and and I don't know if you have an example of one of those where, how do you take action um, with that particular metric? Yeah, um, I'm not going to have a great answer here because again, like our world is really complicated and this legacy CPG company is trying to figure out how to even you know catch up thinking about omni-channel sales, right? Um, and so I'd say the reality is that we have kind of soft fluffy metrics right now. <laughs> um, so, you know, are we able, first, are we even talking about strategy and planning from an Omni full funnel experience? And then are we starting, are we looking at engagement metrics where we can, right? With the site or with key pages on the site or email metrics or retention metrics is one that we also use as a proxy to say, we don't care where someone purchases, but are they actually staying engaged with the brand? Does the content seem like it's re resonating? Um, and so those are the things that we look at right now. Um, so I'd say we're we're kind of early stage in this, um, but some of it is just the complexity of the business model. And they, it's hard to get closed loop measurement and data back to really understand that full customer experience right now. And uh, Tyler or Jeff, any thoughts on metrics that, that you use to manage a bit the, this part of the business? Yeah, we, we, um, we rely pretty heavily on what we call our CSAT score, our customer satisfaction score. And so that's um, a collection of touch points we have with the customer post-purchase, post-application in some cases, post-service, um, uh, where we're, we're, we're requesting feedback um, and, and creating metrics off that. But, you know, I think the reality is that's like the end goal. Um, you know, Vivian, don't be too hard on yourselves. Um, you know, being digital first, we also use a lot of fluffy metrics. Um, and we use a lot of, we use a lot of qualitative feedback we get. So, um, you know, we, we have a regular, um, session called voice of the customer where we're replaying our customer service calls. Um, we are talking to our colorists in the field. We believe very strongly in what we call dog fooding, which is I go into the hair color, my local hair color bar, and I'm actually working the front desk. Um, and I'm checking folks in, I'm checking in with folks, asking them how, how it's going, how is their booking experience. Um, and so we basically require every employee to, to do that. So, you know, um, although the metrics are really important, if you don't measure it, it doesn't change. So, you know, CSAT, NPS, I think are, are really critical. Um, but those qualitative metrics are actually where you find the golden nuggets. Yeah, and I, I would add, um, we, we conduct a lot of voice of, voice of consumer VOC uh, customer surveys after most transactions and touch points. And we do a lot of listening into, into phone calls and reviewing chats and emails. So we get a lot of feedback. I, I think the challenge is, okay, how do you condense it into something that's usable? And we've used NPS. I don't know that it's the best or not the best measure, but it's it's consistent. And we've got enough history going back to see if it's going up or going down. And we'll break it into the various customer facing areas, whether it's our store, the website, customer service, um, the phone experts, what have you. So we can see, you know, are things getting better or things are getting worse. But I think most important, the gold is the comments you get. So we get a tremendous amount of comments. We'll constantly be going in to see is anything trending either upward or downwards, you know, through keywords, what's frustrating people, you know, what's making them happy and, and ideally do more of the latter and less of the former, but it, you know, it sounds easy. I, I think a lot of it is fairly not surprising. Like, like I'll give you one revelation. This will shock everyone. The longer the wait time, the less happy the person. So, I mean, most, most of it and much of it is very obvious. And if you think about it just as a customer, how do you want to be treated? That, that's a lot of it right there. I, I'd say the only other thing I'd add, we're lucky enough to have our, our store is right across the street from our office. And, and like, like Tyler was saying, nothing replaces, you know, taking a walk over there and talking to people. 
you know, one, they're flattered that you're asking, but two, uh, you learn a lot. And I, I think just that anecdotal um, ability to go and engage with people and stay connected is important. So um, switching gears a little bit, we, we asked the question in the polls about um, how, you know, how good are you as a, as a company to fix situations that you identify, um, especially where like one, um, you know, maybe a department or a process is actually contributing to poor uh, customer experience. And like, I don't know, the one example I was thinking of is, you know, the finance department um, you know, gets, you know, sees financial benefit to um, taking longer to refund uh, customers' credit cards for sales, for example. Um, I'm sure there's many others uh, like that, but I, you know, wanted, you know, so, you know, the, what we heard from everyone on the call um, around three quarters, you know, they, they're pretty good at fixing these conflicts, but there's still some that persist. Um, and then there was 18% that they said there's numerous processes that, um, are known to erode cost customer experience, and there's just no plan to fix them. So they they know about it, they live with it. Um, maybe they become those you know bankrupt companies that uh, you were mentioning earlier, Jeff. But um, yeah, I wanted you know kind of bring that question to the panel as you know how how do you you know I, I think that probably it's easier to identify, um, but probably a little bit harder to resolve those, um, especially if they are you know contributing to you know profitability for example and you know i i know you know the person that wrote the uh the net promoter scorebook talks about good profits and bad profits um but i oh, know uh, tyler can we start with you on this sure this one was uh, interesting I, I thought a lot about it um and you know um i think about some of our interactions with finance and accounting and the interesting I didn't part mean to is, pick on finance. But. No, totally. Yeah, I, I love my I love my finance partners. They're they're amazing. Um, they 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 sign the checks, so it's uh, really important. Uh, the but the interesting thing is though, like um, you know, even though some of their short term goals might be at odds, we are always thinking about um, overall CX driving enterprise value um, in any given year, and so you know. Oddly enough, you know, rational thought typically prevails, and so I think um, I think the key point here is having good relationships and having you know a common language and common metrics to to, to talk through um, those problems with, and and when that's available, conflicts fade away pretty quickly. Um, you know, it's gotten a little bit harder in post COVID times where it's all on zoom and, you know, there's one more meeting on the calendar. Um, you can't just sort of walk over to the finance team and have a quick chat. Uh, but outside of that, um, you know, we, 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 I feel pretty proud of, you know, the limited conflict we have around here. I don't know, Jeff or Vivian, anything you want to add there? there? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, it's hard, um, like at a macro level or something that, um, uh, Clorox, we decided that ha does have this trickle down effect is actually between consumers and customers, like I, I said earlier, right? And um, we've clearly said that consumers are the priority. If we get the consumer experience and consumer engagement right, we believe that the retail customers will follow. Um, and so that's an important kind of North Star for us in how we think about planning and even when we're chasing revenue, which yes, in the short term, sometimes um, we run into this conflict. Like one example is pricing strategy. You know, how do you think about pricing strategy between own and operated D2C versus retailers? You have to have map policies out there, or you know, it also makes sense to run sales and discounts at different times of the year. And so you know, I don't think end consumers want to have to go and price shop everywhere and check a bunch of different sites. Um, and so it makes sense to try and keep it as consistent as possible, maybe have the website have, you know, best pricing. We're not in a position to do that overnight. And so it's about how do you do small pilot tests? Um, maybe it's a couple of key SKUs for one brand. And we say, hey, let's try to demonstrate the impact of it. And also, you know, what are the, the retail con 
customers uh, reactions to it. And if it works, then we invest more and more. And so I think it has to, these really kind of sticky cross-functional projects, I think you have to boil it down into how do you do small pilot tests and get everyone to at least say yes to that before you try to um, solve everything overall. I mean, I, I should just add, I mean, I, it, it, you know, you could listen to this conversation and think, oh, it's easy to fix all these problems. And I think everyone realizes how hard it is. There's a lot of organizational nuance and um, leadership that's involved in, in, uh, in resolving some of these things that, that on the face may seem kind of easy. I, seem, I mean, you must uncover a lot of these kinds of conflicts. And I don't know if you have a point of view on what you see most often or what advice you would have for people that um, uncover these and, and how to get them resolved. Sure. Um, and just to add slightly to what Vivian was saying, I think what she's suggesting is A-B testing, right? Which is you try pilot different scenarios, see what's working, resonating based on whatever objective you're trying to achieve with that. that that's a common practice. And you know, there's a lot of technology out there that help enable that. Um, it's been proven very effective for many companies. Um, what works? Um, I think uh, really what we've seen is, and I guess I touched on this earlier, is um, at least some level of organizational um, alignment around uh, the metric or metrics that's most important to them. And so, um, some companies we find it's um, purely revenue-based conversion. So once you get a, a, a prospect to your, say, website, um, getting them to transact and eliminating all the barriers from, from beginning to end to get to that transaction. And so that's usually you know, somebody um, who's measured on, on revenue. And so then that person, there could be a technical issue uh, impacting them, which we often see sometimes is uh, there's errors that, that happen when, when someone's trying to navigate uh, your property in some way, or it could be just poor design and navigation is poor. And so they're struggling trying to, to do whatever they're trying to do on your site. So once, um, you know, you, you can uncover all of these issues because they're whatever is impacting revenue at the end or, or, or um, you know, shopping cart conversion, then somebody, that person can then sort of rally the troops. You know, it, could, it doesn't have to be an army. It could just be, you know, a few key resources that maybe touch on the technical side of the house versus, or the, or the support side of the house to, to um, problem solve. Um, that's been proven most effective um, when it's, you know, um, no one is it, it is really sort of um, responsible for any key component of the CX measurement. Then that's when everybody's just kind of doing their best to 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 to, to do the right thing. Um, uh, the customer support team, like our, you know, the MPS score is falling to the floor, and support tickets are up. Um, you know, uh, they're you know, they're just trying to put the fires out within their own silo, if you will. Um, if they then are empowered to engage with uh, those members of the organization that influence that um, and problem solve and are able to activate those resources and these other groups to help improve that metric, then you see progress. Um, and so, I mean, it, this sounds so basic, I know, uh, but... Um, in large distributed global companies, oftentimes this is hard, even in, you know, not even global companies. So um, you really got to rally around whatever metrics that matter and empower someone to at least champion for that metric, um, you know, within your company. And, and then you'll see incremental progress. So uh, we have about five minutes left and uh, I want to drill down on culture um, because I think that's so important uh, to all of this. And, you know, I think the question for, for each of you would be, you know, what is it about your, the culture at your organization that you think um, is a, you know, very important contributor to um, 
to improving customer experience, whether it's you know how the the incentives um, that are there, or um, is it dog fooding or whatever it might be? Uh, Jeff, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, before I answer that, just a quick thing on the prior question. I I love what what everyone said, and Asim, I think agree. You know, the more people are com have common ground around what are we what are we working for, it helps. And and I also want to caveat it that I work for a private company. I used to work for a public company, which would contradict everything I'm about to say. And I, I just think that, you know, when we talk about great customer experience, typically the surveys will say price is the most important. So if we sold everything for a penny, we'd have very happy customers. I mean, we'd be out of business, but we'd have happy customers. So I, I think it's obviously a balance. And, you know, the Yiddish word for the day is seichel, you know, wisdom, you know, do, do a smart thing. And, and I think it's finding that balance. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that here, uh, you know, the ownership from day one, the owner comes in my office every day and tells me, if you treat the customer right, they'll, they'll, they'll treat us right. And it's, it's very much understanding a long-term view of, of um, you, you know, that, that sort of eliminated most of the conflicts here. But I think the danger is these small decisions that erode the experience nibble by nibble that in and, of in and of themselves are innocent and do nothing. But when you aggregate and accumulate them, they could kill your company. And, and that gets to, ch to culture. I mean, it's really hard to build and really easy to destroy. And it's all these little decisions that are be being made, not necessarily by the CEO, but by, you know, throughout, by imagine the customer service agent, how is he or she handling a request? Are they empowered? to solve a problem. I mean, I hope to think here they are, but you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So um, it's like, where, where does your culture show up? Every, again, everyone has customer first in their culture, how they articulate it, or most people do. Um, but, but really, how does it show up when there's a conflict? Is, you know, how does it show up in decision-making? Um, how does it show up when customers are looking for help? And how does that get handled? What's the urgency of solving issues? And, and what's the tolerance for not solving issues kind of coming from the top of the company? So I, th I think it's just really hard work and everything flows from it. No, you know, I know it's a little general, but that's, that's the seichel of the day. All right. Well, thank you for the, for the wisdom uh, there. Uh, Vivian, how about you? Yeah. Um... I guess culture-wise, I, I think it's, I want to say combination of taking a long-term view and long-term perspective, because I think that's where the, okay, putting consumer first, that it makes sense, but in the short term, it could mean trade-offs, right? For sometimes it's revenue, um, and sometimes the easier levers to pull are not the ones that do the hard work and really dig in there to see like where the hurdles that consumers are facing um, or even something like just chasing new acquisition versus trying to build retention among consumers and building loyalty over time. Like all of the things that really get to consumer experience are, are hard as we've talked about um, today. So I think it's that. Um, I think the other piece is right openness to feedback if you're really going to put consumer experience first, I think it has to be a company culture that is willing to see places that were failing and saying, how do we correct that? Um, otherwise, you know, it's easy to have blinders on to, and ignore um, those opportunities. And so I think that's probably kind of that the big one for me. All right. And Tyler. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Vivian said. Hopefully it's a, my own little cycle for the day. Did I get that right, Jeff? Cycle? Uh, pretty, um, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good? Okay, a little, I got, it's a little bit to learn. But um, we play this game at Madison Reed called the, the Lies We Tell Ourselves. And I actually think it lives a lot with customer experience because you know we believe that our unboxing experience is incredible, that our digital experience is incredible, that when they walk into the hair and our booking experience, like everything is incredible. Um, and I think it's important for us to take a pulse every once in a while and think like, what are the lies in here that we tell ourselves to like, you know, blind us to, to, to reality? Um, and I just think it's a good experience. It's a good, it's a good practice to get into around customer experience. Um, and you really get that through talking to customers and that, and that honest feedback. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, and uh, I know 
um, the, uh, you know, finding talent is uh, critical uh, in 2022, um, more than most years. So I want to have each of you, uh, now that you've all wowed us with your cool cultures that support great customer experience, um, you know, Jeff, do you have customer experience positions open and where can people find them? Uh, yes, bnh.com. All right, Vivian. Please, please. <laughs> uh, well, as you've heard, we, we think about this from all angles and always looking for good people. Find me on LinkedIn, I guess. Tyler. Yeah, shoot me a note on LinkedIn. We have tons of roles available across the entire country. So, um, yeah, please do reach out. We'd love to connect. And Asim. Oh word. yeah. Every function, uh, software development, marketing, digital campaign management, customer support, you name it, glassbox.com or just uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. All right. Well, Jeff, Vivian, Tyler, Asim, thank you all so much for uh, covering a, a really important topic, one that uh, sounds easy but is really hard as we've been uh, discussing. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this and sharing your insights and experience with our community. And uh, for everyone listening, we will see you again on February 23rd for our next webinar on gifting. Uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank, thank you. you.